Buenas noches, good evening everyone. I'm Ricardo Alberto Maldonado, Associate Director of the 92nd Street Wise Unterberg Poetry Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's readings by Quan Berry and Ocean Vuong. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody of upcoming events in our reading series. This Thursday, we're hosting Jennifer Egan and Don Lee. Next week, Aisa Davis and Tracy K. Smith will be doing a stage reading of Lucille Clifton's Generations. Maggie Sith will be reading Ann Carson's The Glass Essay. And later on, we'll be welcoming the winners of our Discovery Poetry Contest, as well as Martina Espada and Raquel Salas Rivera, Maxine Hong Kingston, and Hilary Mantel. Most of these will take place in person and online, so you can tune in from home in your pajamas or here. For a full slate of programs, visit 92y.org slash readings. Following the readings, Barry and Buong will take audience questions. If you have questions, please write it down on one of the ushers' note cards. You should be getting them soon and submit it to them during the reading. Afterwards, you may purchase pre-signed copies of the reader's books, which are available courtesy of Postman Books. And now, please join me in welcoming Kwan Bari. Good evening. I was told I can move this, so I'm like, as a, as a smaller person, I, I sometimes need some help there. But uh, first of all, some thank yous. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to the 92nd Street Y for having me, and thank you to Ocean for sharing the stage with me. Um, I'm both a poet and a fiction writer and also a playwright, and today I'm going to read you some poetry and some fiction as well. Um, so this very first poem takes place about two and a half hours north of here in Saratoga Springs. Auction. What was I wearing? I don't recall. I remember walking down a series of switchbacks away from the Italianate mansion where all of her children died. Night was entering, inching over the world horizontally from right to left, the moon structured whiteness, an objet d'art. Then we arrived at the beautiful space filled with beautiful gold flecked people. Everywhere, strings of light, illuminated filigree, a world webbed with stars, the feeling of bodily effervescing. No, I hadn't been to the track. I had heard that was where squalor lived, a barely contained seediness that was allowed. I am one who has been reared to prefer the cultivated, black tie, men in tuxedos trailing with push brooms, sweeping up the bready droppings the way they break apart so easily, loosing their fragrance of earth and grass. Why should this veneer fail me now? Watching the crowd lean forward, smelling their hunger, the sounds of the gavel falling like a cudgel on a head, and the good people rushing forward to shake the hand of the victorious. I saw our history in it, roped right there in the ring. The muscled beauty of excellence, the monocular acuity, how the breadth of the eye evolved for speed. It stood on the dais as the groom lovingly turned its best side to the light, its best side being every side, coat gleaming like blackest water. The whole room instantly aroused, the men's pants tenting, the women with their sudden secretions, as happens when you are in the presence of the holiest of forms. It was looking at us with an awareness beyond time, casting its 50-foot parabolic gaze broadly over the earth. Admittedly, as my mind filled with images of heated brands and whips, I thought of Christ last, the petals of blood licking his face. It was every being who has ever stood center stage in chains, all of us implicated simply by being there, regardless of sympathy or intent. Then I heard a voice shout 2.2 and another go higher. The most pragmatic teaching Jesus ever gave, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. The gavel finally falling on 2.8 million. But what if we don't know the difference? No, it wasn't just my presence that made me a participant to spectacle, which explains why I've carried this haunting ever since. He said the poor will be with us always, and I ran with it. I let it let me off the hook. 
Then the groom, tuxedo dark as ink, himself descended from such brutality, turned and let it out. Sorry, I'm old school and a New Englander. So uh, New England is like, I don't know, I, I just, I'm really into silence, but I appreciate the gesture, so thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, I'll also be reading some fiction tonight, so I'm going to read just like the first couple of paragraphs from each of my three novels. So my first novel came out in 2015, and it's called She Weeps Each Time You're Born. Um, it takes place in Vietnam, and there's sort of like a prologue that happens in that. So I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs from it. And so there's a character named Amy Kwan in it. And then there's also two people that she's traveling with who are her motorcycle guides, um, Hong and Tan. So you'll hear them mentioned as well. So again, this is the beginning of my novel, She Weeps Each Time You're Born. The sandpan ride back down the Swallowed Bird River is uneventful. Everywhere, the dragonflies floating, fat and red in the late afternoon sun. The same oarswoman who rowed us out to the mountain of the fragrant traces now methodically bears us away. We're all tired, even crazy hung. His sunglasses firmly in place, seems to slump in his seat, a cigarette burning down between his fingers. The water is calm, the landscape lush and meditative, and when it comes time to leave the boat, the three of us remain sitting for a moment as if stunned, hardly believing the day is almost over. On the back of Tan's motorcycle, I pass the same sights we saw on the way out. Everything looks familiar, like scenes from a previous life. The harvest still drying in the middle of the road, the people doubled over in the paddies in the fading light. I have spent the last week touring around the northern countryside with Hung and Tan as my guides. After only a few days, I trust them completely. Then Hung pulls up alongside one more time, his motorcycle splashed with mud. He looks at Tan and makes a hand signal before taking off up the road. There one thing more, Tan shouts over the roar of the engine. Because you lucky, Amy Kwan, yells Tan. Hung thinks, maybe she sees us. Um, so, you know, I write both fiction and poetry, and it's true that, um, like, writing a novel just takes a little bit longer. So I haven't really been writing as many poems in the last couple of years, but for whatever reason, I am a sucker for things that happen on CNN. I'll, I'll see something on CNN, I'm like, ah, oh, it's gotta be a poem. So, uh, and, and something else that I'm a real sucker for, I'm a real sucker for living fossils. So living fossils are animals, and it usually happens that a fisherman somewhere pulls something out of the ocean that nobody knew still existed, and people are amazed by it. And this happened a few years, a few years ago, and I wrote this poem. The poem is called, Living Fossil, Living God. Admittedly, there is something about its face the boxy, pugilistic snout, the prehistoric eyes that seem to stare down through 80 million years back to the very days of T-Rex. Though taxonomically, the frilled shark is no, is no shark, cutting through the lightless waters 5,000 feet down, the creature looks to be the very essence of the reptilian brain, cold-blooded, beyond even the crocodile, that seemingly soulless armory of plates a creature grounded wholly in the now with no inner life beyond the moment. What would it be to be this presence skirting through the dark with its rows of teeth, a consciousness beyond mind that watches what mind does, its sorrows, a being that grows its young for three and a half years in the dark night of its belly, the longest gestation of any in the animal kingdom, and how it only comes to us from time to time, pulled up in some fisherman's net for all to behold the undying wonders of the sea. To have lived on into the Anthropocene, this creature mostly blind, simply structured, unchanging, feeding on small squids and fishes, others of its kind. Please don't misunderstand. I believe God does not exist in time, but because we do, we cannot understand it. But imagine 80, year, 80 million years passing second by second, when I look at this animal, I see God. Um, so for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, I, most, I wrote poetry, I wrote four books of poetry, and then I, I wrote my first novel, which is a very sad and lyrical novel about Vietnam. 
and about um, the history of Vietnam in the last hundred years. And then when I decided like my next fiction project was going to be was this uh, book set in the 1980s that follows a girls field hockey team who uses witchcraft to win games. Because I'm like, why not, right? So this, this, um, so my novel, We Write Upon Sticks, it takes place in my hometown. My hometown is Danvers, Massachusetts. Um, Danvers, anyone, anyone? So, um, no Danvers, but so Danvers, back in 1692, Salem was much bigger, and Danvers was actually a part of Salem called Old Salem Village. And actually, the, the incidents that spurred the Salem witch trials actually began in Danvers. Um, and so my novel does. It's set in the 1980s, and it follows this girl's team of uh, field hockey players as they begin, obviously, terribly. Then they turn to witchcraft, and then they begin to win. So these are just like the, this is just like the first page from that novel. Um, yes, so first chapter, Danvers versus Maskonomit. Two minutes into the second half, Masco's number 19 took an indirect shot on our goal. For a moment, we lost sight of the ball in the scrum of players huddled in front of the net, the air blurry with sticks, as if a hundred defenders were trying to clear it and a hundred others were trying to score. Considering how the first half went down, there really wasn't any reason for those of us on offense to keep watching, our defense porous as a broken window. True, our opponents, the Maskinomic chieftains, hadn't officially put it in the net, but it was a foregone conclusion, the ball already as good as in, another Masco goal adorning the scoreboard. Girl Corey turned and started the humiliating trek back to midfield. A few of us began to follow. Come on, guys, pleaded Abney Putnam as she watched our offense retake its positions on the center line, readying ourselves for yet another back pass that restarts play after a goal. Masco hasn't even scored yet. No sooner were the words out of her mouth than the ball found daylight, shooting out of the throng and right through our own Mel Boucher's heavily padded feet. Abby hung her head, temporarily deflated. An empty potato chip bag went sailing by, a tumbleweed in the wind. Quickly, she pulled herself together and jogged back to midfield, where the rest of our offense was already waiting, our forward line fanning ourselves with our sticks like a flock of overheated southern bells. Come here often, offered Jen Fiorenza snidely from her position at left forward, but we were all too tired to tell her to cram it. Um, so the first two poems I read were obviously about animals. So there was the horse poem, auction, and there was the frilled shark. Um, so I'm gonna read another, another poem about animals. And this one, um, so again, CNN, thank you very much. I have to, it's either CNN or NPR. Those are like the two places where all of my ideas come from. And so some years ago, very, very sad story on CNN, there was a man who owned an exotic petting zoo, although the animals really weren't meant to be petted because many of them were very dangerous. Um, so this man had his own private zoo, you know, with lions and things like that. And I guess he had tax trouble. I'm a little fuzzy on that part of the story, but he basically at one time he was jailed um, for tax reasons. And one day, I'm not sure again the exact chronology of how it happened, he, he, he came home and he opened all the cages to his animals' cages. And, um, and then the man committed suicide. But the animals, many of which were very dangerous, actually had to be shot because many of them went out. And um, it was very sad because some of the animals were actually pretty rare. Um, and uh, so this, po this poem is from the point of view of the animals. And it's called Loose Strife. When he comes to the gate for the very last time, the predators among us can smell the difference. Every art needs a structure, hormones flooding the blood. Even the wildest gardens contain some form of order. In the day, our eyes not as efficient as in the night, but nevertheless, only the old grizzly cannot see the difference. The way his skin hangs slack on the bone. The way when loosed, a pig will revert to its atavistic form, bristles thickening, the curved tucks protruding from the mouth. The monkey says that sometimes, some among them are deemed unfit. And when this happens, the offender is sent away to live the life we live in a room made of bars. Yes, the Bengal tigers can smell it, the lions as if frenzied, covenant. After all these years, when he opens the door to our cages, deliverance. Imagine Pandora's box from the Greek word pithos, what in actuality, what in actuality was a jar 
and urn, a vessel large enough that the ancients often interred their dead in it. Imagine on her wedding night the woman lifting the lid and the newly freed darkness seeping out to the four cardinal points. Afterward, the small light burning at the bottom of the jar in among the dregs. Some of you think he was getting revenge. Some of you think he was simply freeing us, animal emancipation. How, after a year-long sentence, he finally came to know we were his brothers. What each and every one of us will find out there in the annihilating daylight, even the rarest among us, the ones with less than a thousand left in the kingdom. A thing should be what it was made to be. Some of us will be shot dead even as we stand in our cages, the instinct long degenerated that would have told us how to flee. Um, and so after writing a book about a girls 1989 field hockey team who uses witchcraft, I decided to write a book about Buddhist monks. Um, and so uh, my book, uh, my latest book, which just came out this spring, it's called When I'm Gone, Look for Me in the East. And basically it follows a group of uh, Tibetan monks, uh, Mongolian Tibetan monks in Mongolia who go looking for a reincarnation. And so I'm just going to read this, just like the first page from that novel. Um, i trying to think if there's anything in it. So yeah, so this is told, it's first person. It's um, one of the young monks who's been charged with helping the group um, find this reincarnation. And so he's traveling from his remote monastery in Mongolia. He's traveling to Ulaanbaatar, the, um, the capital city, where he'll meet the other group and then they'll leave from there. But this is just him as he's slowly trying to make his way from his monastery to the capital city. Listen without distraction. Outside the post office in Boerurt, a handful of men clump around a pool table, its felt top sun ravaged and mangy. The men's faces are weathered from living in a world without trees. When I step outside, they stare, each man a finger in a fist, and the one slumped in the ratty camping chair at the head of the table is the thumb. I glance at the digital watch the Rinpoche hands me last night, its plastic band already cracked, the thing used. I know it is a necessity, that I must have it for the places I am to journey to in my search that must not fail. Nevertheless, I feel like one of the wild horses foreign researchers shoot with arrow guns, the animal succumbing so that the researcher can fix the radio collar around its neck, the collar eventually becoming a part of the body. After just a few hours in the July light, the skin around my wrist is already somewhat paler than the rest of me, though like the planets and the summer sun, nothing is permanent. It is ten in the morning. The main road through Boerurt periodically billows with dust as a breeze blows through town. The men stare at me and then look away. Someone spits in the dirt. Hidden in the folds of my robe, there is a bag filled with more tukruk than they can earn in six months or even a year if the winter is harsh. Normally, they would be out on the grasslands, out watching their flocks or herding them in for one of the two daily milkings. But today, they drive the many kilometers into Boerurt on their motorbikes to bring their wives in to do the shopping. The men huddle idly around the table, as men often do as they wait for women. Men with time on their hands, looking to establish their status among their kind. I step out of the post office and their faces fall. I am not what they, were, I am not what they want. I am a novice of the Yatu Jingle Monastery, a monk who lives in the shadow of the sleeping volcano. As it is mid-morning, the mail truck I am to ride to Ulaanbaatar on the first stage of my journey is not scheduled to arrive for hours. 2,500 years ago, Gautama Buddha says, you only lose that which you cling to. Silently, I approach the table and nod. Brother, booms the one enthroned in the camping chair. He is sitting with his legs spread wide, a toothpick in his fingers as he works at his teeth. Something in the lackadaisical arrangement of his limbs reminds me of Mun, Mun's long black hair often loose like a horse's mane. I only play for money, the man says. A good policy, I say. I lay 2,000 tukruk on the table. Ten minutes later, and I can tell the others do not know who to root for. The one who sits outside the post office each day looking to deprive the local herdsmen of their money, 
or me, a young monk from Yatu Gol in his simple red robe. My body wavers like a flame in the summer heat. On the faded table, the balls roll and crack like stars. Um, I think I have three more things I'm going to read. So I'm going to read this poem. Um, I actually, I, I was telling people behind stage, I just recently went and saw Hades Town. I'm like, I'm in town from the Midwest. I'm going to shows. Um, so yeah, so I saw Hades Town, and I was really fascinated by it because many, many years ago on NPR, I um, I heard the the composer of the of the musical um, sing one of the songs from it, and it was before she'd actually put the musical itself together. So it was many, many years ago. She sang this amazing song song called "Build the Wall," and I remember I was just so touched by it back then. Um, and then I saw the show just just yesterday, and it's true. When the song came on, I was like, ah, you know, yeah. Anyway, but um, so this particular poem, it's maybe a little sentimental, but. Um, I wrote it in either 2017 or 2018 when there were many images on TV of children being caged along the southern border. And uh, on CNN, I saw there was, they were interviewing people who lived along the southern border and there was a man who, just, who basically said that he, he, he was a resident there and he said that he basically didn't care what was happening to people. And I saw that and it was just, uh, and I wrote this poem, which it begins with a speaker um, talking about their own childhood. So that speaker perhaps is me, but. The man on the TV in the border town says he, he feels nothing for them. It was just after lunch in the yellow room when I wouldn't get out of the car and how pleased my grandmother was made by this news, wrapping her arms around me as I sat there in the front between her and grandpa. And they did what they threatened they would do. They took me home with them, past the point of pines where the planes come down over Boston Harbor. Just the other night, I dreamed of the two of them, happy and shining as I threw the blue blanket over their bed. It was good to see them, to be reminded of the afternoon when I was four, and I crawled in their car after lunch and would not be moved. And so they took me home to Winthrop, just east of Boston, where my grandmother floated happily around the kitchen as there was a child in the house again, the feel of her hand on the back of my neck, a presence I can feel even now when I am still. But later, after the sun went down, a child of four, I missed my home, my brothers, my sisters, my dog, the lion quilt my mother hand sewed for me that I slept under each night. And so my parents were summoned to drive through the dark and come and get me. And they did, they do, they will. They are coming even now through this terrible dark child. They are coming with all of their love and all of their hope, with everything they are, they are coming. Please believe we are coming for you, even if the world would have you believe we aren't. So just two more things. Um, so I have a new novel that I'm working on, which is, because um, why not, right? So it's a, it's a horror novel. I, I don't actually read horror books. I can't. I just can't. I don't watch horror movies. Um, Stephen King like scares the bejesus out of me, but um, but somehow I'm going to write a horror book. <laughs> it's going to be good, and it's it's set in Antarctica. And I, I actually was in again. It's crazy the places I've been to, and I and I'm fortunate that my university research helps me do these things. Um, so I was in Antarctica many, many, many years ago, and the thing that's described, I'm just going to read the, a paragraph from this novel, which as of right now, there's only one chapter of it, but someday there'll be more. And um, so this is, I actually did go kayaking, and I actually did see some of the things that are described in this, but then obviously there's other things that happened that I did not see. So tentatively, the, the novel right now is tentatively titled, My God is Godly which was a quote from Kathleen Scott, who was the widow of Robert Scott, who was the polar explorer who died trying to find the South Pole. So, And uh, in this, there's a person named Percy. Percy is basically the kayak guide leader. So that's all you really need to know. My God is godly. Percy was still pointing to the spot where the leopard seal went under, the Adeli grasped in the seal's ripping teeth, the kind of teeth you don't expect on an animal with the word seal in its name. A seal is supposed to be cheerful and fun, a red and white striped ball balanced on the end of its perky black nose. But this is pure, uncut nature, baby, the world unvarnished, bladed. 
Percy is telling them how you don't see this every day, up close and personal. A leopard seal breaking its prey's back by savaging it on the water. The way a dog will sometimes get hold of a rope and smack it from side to side on the ground as if beating the thing to death. The Adelie penguin simply a chew toy. Then someone's kayak flies up and smashes Percy in the back of the head. Yes, that Percy, our Percy, indestructible Percy, Percy who crewed for New Zealand in the last Olympics, Percy of the broad chest and muscled neck, who was just telling us for this once to just put down our goddamn phones and really look to have a true and direct experience of the, ple of the thing. Please, mates, this is Gaga. For a moment, the front of his face reiterating about the leopard seal being the area's number one predator obviously excluding Orca, and then suddenly something in his eyes registers as wrong, his skull caving in, letting the light in, the whole world as if tossed in a blender, and Stryker doesn't re really remember the rest, won't remember the rest, even though she is a being who loves turbulence, the feel of your stomach suddenly flipping, Stryker going so far as to seek it out, the sensation of being unmoored, centerless, yes, even after the rest is over and she finds herself on the other side of this, even and then she might still refuse to acknowledge it because God, the blood, but mostly the howling. All right, last poem. So this last poem is also called Loose Strife. So this is a, a book called Loose Strife and most of the poems in it are called Loose Strife. And it came about, it was a collaboration I did with a friend of mine who's a visual artist. And we, did, we came up with a theme and the theme was Loose Strife. And what we meant by that, it's a, it's a Greek term actually, and many of us are familiar with the plant. But basically Loose Strife from the Greek, Lusamake, is the idea of, um, loosing chaos in the world. And so we were interested in this idea that's been around since the ancient Greeks of different kinds of ways in which violence is loosed in the world. So the book deals with like environmental violence, economic violence, um, physical violence. And this particular book poem also deals with emotional violence. Some of you might remember a few years ago when General David Petraeus had an affair with his biographer, which if you're gonna have, that's, that's the way to do it, right? If you want a biography that's gonna be uh, sympathetic to you. But anyway, the reason, why it came, the reason why it came to light was because the woman, whose name I actually don't want to say is because General David Petraeus has gone on to have an amazing career, and yet her life, I'm, my understanding is that her life, she's never been able to get back on track, because that's how these things work, right? But, um, but, but basically, at the time, it was found out because she, she was jealous of another woman, and she sent this other woman like 30,000 emails in a single month. Um, yeah, it was, it was in the thousands. And so anyway, I was just thinking about it in terms of like how love makes us, like who hasn't been there, you know? <laughs> So, uh, so this is my final poem, but thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> Loose Strife. I will not say its name, the way it ruined me. The body halved, a kind of mitosis. Suddenly, everything on the cellular level as if sentient. The potatoes growing eyes in the dark under the sink. The way Lysimachus, for whom the invasive is named, walked and walked through the terrible burning. The emotion openly disfiguring his face. The way a lover will sometimes turn directly toward the beloved in that other language, the thing shuddering under the skin until it floats up into the light with all the colors of ephemera and bursts. There was a maze. There was a photograph of the night sky taken over several hours, the stars like scratches on a record. As far as I know, there is no unified theory as to why it exists except the theory of the animal, the theory of glands and secretions. It comes when it comes, and if fortunate, it comes without end. The lesser vertebrates rub themselves in its musk, coat themselves in its glory. It ruined me, and I let it. Hands held above my head as if under arrest. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, to the 92nd Street Y for having us in this beautiful historic place that has also been supporting poetry and poets for so many decades. And uh, I feel really blessed uh, to share this microphone and this stage with um, a poet who I really admire, Amy Wanberry. So thank you so much. Um, 
like Amy, I'm also from New England. And the thing about New Englanders is that no matter when you're born, you're always old school. Um, so <laughs> so I'm, I'm old school. Um, uh, I'll read a, a few poems, and then uh, we can have a conversation. Um, but, but thank you so much for being here uh, for poetry. It is the, the art that helped me find my way, and um, I'm happy to, to work in it. it. It kind of taught me how to write all the sentences. Uh, I want to start with reading this poem called um, American Legend. It's uh, in conversation with Robert Creeley's I Know a Man. And if you know that poem, it's about driving. Um, I always tell myself that um, my poems are myths of, um, of the real. They are mythical alternatives of the real. And it's perhaps more true here than ever, because I'm writing a poem about driving, but I don't know how to drive. <laughs> um, so uh, this myth is, might actually be a fantasy. American legend. So I was driving with my old man. The day wasted, save for the cobalt haze closing around us. We were on our way to kill our dog, Susan. I mean, we had to bring her to the clinic to put her down this murder, or maybe they meant put her in the ground. Though I knew Susan would be ashed in the incinerator, out back puffs of smoke, little ghost poodles, where was I going with this? Right, the car, the rain, the legend of joy and pain, my old man and I, the Ford big enough for us to never touch, and maybe I meant to make the hairpin turn too hard, and the thing flipped like a new law going 80. Maybe I wanted at last to feel him against me, and it worked. As the colors spun through the windshield, Wild metal clanking our shoulders, the sudden wetness warm everywhere. He slammed into me and we hugged for the first time in decades. It was perfect and wrong like money on fire. The skin around his neck so soft, his aftershave somehow summer. It lasted not a second, but he was smiling, his teeth already half gone, as if someone wiped them away to make room for something truer. Put it down on the page, son, he said one night after telling me why he did what he did with his life shit-faced on Hennessy. We were sitting at the kitchen table before his shift at the sock factory, his eyes raindrops in a nightmare. I touched him, then let go. The car stopped rolling. We hung upside down as things dripped steam or breath. I did what any boy would do after getting exactly what he wanted. I kissed my father. He grinned, I think, his pupils elsewhere. I reached back, unlatched the cage. The dog stepped out, sniffed my old man, still warm, then ran into the trees, into her second future. I walked from the wreck till the yards became years. The dirt rode a city until my face became this Face, and the rain washed the gasoline clean from my fingers. I found a payphone in the heart of the poem and called you collect to say all this, knowing it won't make a difference, only more. So hello, hi. The blood inside my hands is now inside the world. Words the prophets tell us destroy nothing they can't rebuild. I did it to hold my father, to free my dog. It's an old story, mother. Anyone can tell it. Uh, 
Um, this next poem is titled A Beautiful Short Loser. And uh, my, my cousin um, is blessed um, with being on the spectrum. And often I'm, I'm he's obsessive with, with things and so I, I, I often try to give him history lessons because he asked me, what is, what is Vietnamese? And I was telling him about this, so he, you know, he looks up to me one day, he says, so it looks like we're, we're short losers. <laughs> you know, um, and I said, all right, all right. Um, and I said, well, we're, there's also a lot of beautiful things, you know? It's all beautiful. And he very matter-of-factly, as he does, he says, oh, so we're beautiful short losers. <laughs> so, and I, I think from that day on, I, I always see Vietnamese people as beautiful short losers. <laughs> Stand back. I'm a loser on a winning streak. I got your wedding dress on backward, playing air guitar in these streets. I taste my mouth the most, and what a blessing. The most normal things about me are my shoulders. You've been warned. Where I'm from, it's only midnight for a second and the trees look like grandfathers laughing in the rain. For as long as I can remember, I've had a preference for mediocre bodies, including this one. Tell me this, how come the past tense is always longer? Is the memory of a song the shadow of a sound, or is that too much? Sometimes, when I can't sleep, I imagine Van Gogh singing Leonard Cohen's hallelujah into his cut ear and feeling peace. Green voices in the rain. Green rain in the voices. Oh no, the sadness is intensifying. How rude. Hey, knocks on my skull. Can you get me out of here? That one time Jackson passed out beside a triple stack of jumbo pancakes at Denny's after top surgery. I can't believe I lost my tits, he said, a minute before, smiling through tears. The sadness in him ends in me tonight. It ends tonight, I shouted to the cop who pulled us over for dreaming. I'm not high, officer. I just believe in miracles. Tomorrow, partly cloudy with a chance. I'm done talking, sir. I'm saying what I feel. Inside my head, the war is everywhere. I'm on the cliff of myself, and these aren't wings, they're futures. For as long as I can remember, my body was the mayor's nightmare. Now, I'm a beautiful short loser, dancing in the green. Do you think I'll need a gun where we're going? Can you believe my uncle worked at the cult factory for 15 years only to use a belt at the end? Talk about discipline. Talk about good Lord. Maybe he saw that a small thing moving through a large thing is more like a bird in a cage than a word in the mouth. Nobody's free without breaking open. I'm not sad, he told me once, laughing. I'm just always here. See, officer, magic is real. We all disappear. Why aren't you laughing? No, 
not beauty, but you and I outliving it, which is more so. Somehow, I got me for days, got this late light in the yard, leaving blood on the bone-colored fence, this thrash of spring we drown in to stay a while and mean it, I mean it when I say I'm mostly male that I recall every follicle in the failure, the way they'll remember God after religion, alone, impossible, and good. I know. I know the room you've been crying in is called America. I'm sorry the door is not invented yet. Finally, after years, I'm now a professional loser. I'm crushing it in losses. I'm mopping the floor where Jackson's drain bags leaked on his way to bed. I'm done talking, sir. I'm dancing in the rain with a wedding dress, and it makes sense because my uncle decided to leave this world intact. Because taking a piece of my friend away from him made him more whole. Because where I'm from, the trees look like family laughing in my head. Because I'm the last of my kind at the beginning of hope because what I did with my one short, beautiful life was lose it on a winning streak. Um, two more poems. Uh, this one is a long one uh, called Not Even. Hey, I used to be a fag, now I'm a checkbox. The pen tip jabbed in my back, I feel the mark of progress. I will not dance alone in the municipal graveyard at midnight, blasting sad songs on my phone for nothing. I promise you, I was here. I felt things that made death so large it was indistinguishable from air. And I went on destroying inside it like wind in a storm. The way Lil Peep says, I'll be back in the morning when you know how it ends. The way I kept dancing when the song was over because it freed me. The way the street light blinks twice before waking up for its night shift like we do. The way we look up and whisper sorry to each other, the boy and I, when there's teeth, when there's always teeth on purpose. When I threw myself into gravity and made it work, ha. Huh. I made it out by the skin of my grief. I used to be a fag, now I'm lit. Ha! Huh. Once, at a party set on a rooftop in Brooklyn for an artsy vibe, a young woman said, sipping her drink, you're so lucky, you're gay, plus you get to write about war and stuff. I'm just white, I got nothing. Laughter, glasses clinking. Because everyone knows, yellow pain pressed into American letters turns to gold. Our sorrow, Midas touched, napalm with a rainbow afterglow. Unlike feelings, blood gets realer, 
when you feel it. I'm trying to be real, but it costs so much. They say the earth spins, and that's why we fall. But everyone knows it's the music. It's been proven difficult to dance to machine gun fire. Still, my people made a rhythm this way, a way my people so still in the photographs as corpses. My failure was that I got used to it. I looked at us, mangled under the time photographer's shadow, and stopped thinking, get up, get up. I saw the graveyard steam in the pinkish dawn and knew the dead were still breathing. Ha. Huh. If they come for me, take me out. What if it wasn't the crash that made us, but the debris? What if it was meant this way, the mother, the lexicon, the line of cocaine on the mohawked boy's collarbone in an East Village sublet in 2007? What's wrong with me, Doc? There must be a pill for this. Because the fairy tales were right. You'll need magic to make it out of here. Long ago, in another life on an Amtrak through Iowa, I saw for a few blurred seconds a man standing in the middle of a field of winter grass, hands at his sides, back to me, all of him stopped there, save for his hair scraped by low wind. When the countryside resumed its wash of gray wheat, tractors, gutted barns, black sycamores in herdless pastures, I started to cry. I put my copy of Didion's The White Album down and folded a new dark around my head. The woman beside me stroked my back, saying in a Midwestern accent that wobbled with tenderness, go on, son, you get that out now. No shame in breaking open, you get that out, and I'll fetch us some tea which made me lose it even more. She came back with Lipton and paper cups, her eyes nowhere blue and there. She was silent all the way to Missoula, where she got off and said, patting my knee, God is good, God is good. I can say it was gorgeous now, my harm, because it belonged to no one else to be a dam for damage. My shittiness will not enter the world, I thought, and quickly became my own hero. Do you know how many hours I've wasted watching straight boys play video games? <laughs> the struggle is real. Enough. Time is a mother. Lest we forget, a morgue is also a community center. In my language, the one I recall now only by closing my eyes, the word for love is ew, and the word for weakness is ew. How you say what you mean changes what you say. Some call this prayer. I call it watch your mouth. Rose, I whispered as they zipped my mother in her body bag. Get out of there. Your plants are dying. Enough is enough. Time is a motherfucker, I said to the gravestones, alive, absurd. Body, doorway that you are, be more than what I'll pass through. Stillness, that's what it was. The man in the field in the red sweater, he was so still, he became somehow 
more true, like a knife wound in a landscape painting. Like him, I caved. I caved and decided it will be joy from now on. Then everything opened. The lights blazed around me into a white weather, and I was lifted, wet and bloody, out of my mother, into the world, screaming, and enough. Thank you, and I'll end with this poem. Um, I always wanted to write a poem in the voice of a dinosaur. Um, but it felt so impossible. Um, so I decided to write in the voice of the last dinosaur, which uh, somewhere in me feels like there's one more left out there hiding out. And maybe they, they sound a bit like this. The Last Dinosaur. When they ask me what it's like, I tell them, imagine being born in a hospice on fire. As my relatives melted, I stood on one leg, raised my arms, shut my eyes, and thought, tree, 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 as death passed me untouched. I didn't know God saw in us a failed attempt at heaven. Didn't know my eyes had three shades of white, but only one image of my mother. She's standing under an ancient redwood, sad that her time on earth is all she owns. Oh, human, I'm not mad at you for winning, but that you never wished for more. Emperor, of language, why didn't you master no without forgetting maybe? Sure, we can make out if you want. <laughs> but I'm warning you, it's a lot. <laughs> Sometimes I think gravity was like, to be brutally honest, and then never stop talking. <laughs> I guess what I mean is that I ate the apple, not because the man lied when he said I was born of his rib, but that I wanted to fill myself with its hunger for the ground where the bones of my people still dream of me. I bet the light on this page isn't invented yet. I bet you never guessed that my ass was once a small town wonder. <laughs> that the triceratops went nuts when I danced. How once after weeks of drought, I walked through my brother's laughter just to feel the rain. O oh, windbroke wanderer, widow of hope and ha-has, O oh, sister, dropped seed, help me. I was made to die, but I'm here to stay. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Um, I'm going to start asking them. Uh, we got a few, so I hope we can get to as many as we can. Um, the first one, given that this concert hall is blossoming with younger writers tonight, instead of asking the usual why and when you opt for fiction or poetry, or though, although you're welcome to answer that, um, I, meaning Ricardo, would like to know how do you cultivate that part of you that understands and knows to follow the form that your heart dictates? <laughs> can, you, can you repeat the question? <laughs> it's a question about form. Uh, but instead of asking the, the usual, when is it fiction? When is it a novel? When is it a poem? Like, how do you honor that inner part of you that says it has to be this, it must be that? Um, you don't really know. You know, you, you try. I think, um, you know, the, you, many things fail. But I think part of, of my approach is to trust that the themes and the wonder inherent in them are inexhaustible. So you write a poem considering one question, and right away I, I ask of other forms if it can hold the same question. And so the form is the architecture towards one vision. Um, and so many other forms, many genres become other ways to hold the same questions. And uh, I told myself that if, if I'm asking the same question in a different form, but it doesn't surprise me, if I don't discover anything, then I'll go back to poetry, which has always been faithful for me. Um, but it has always offered new, new things. And, and so I think it's a curiosity of whether um, the medium can lead you to somewhere new, even within the same material. Uh, and, and so I think you can spend your whole life asking a handful of potent questions. Uh, but the quest is really to find uh, form. I think everything, you know, you go into a church or a cathedral, a synagogue, a house, a temple, um, and then you, you realize that they have, their vision uh, was to, to find uh, the right way to embody space. Um, and I think that's at least my impulse through, through the different genres. Amy? I think for me, I, you know, you said it's, it's a new way of asking an old question. How do you know poetry? How do you know fiction? How do you know a play? And I might answer it in the old way, right? So in thinking about it for me, because um, there are no absolutes, so I never feel like anything has to be one thing or the other. But I have, you know, noticed over the span of my, like, now many decades career, which is crazy to say, but I've noticed that for me, poetry is a space of question asking. Like if I'm interested in a question, I go to poems, right? When I'm interested in storytelling, then obviously I come to the novel, and it's particularly if I'm interested in characters, right? And I also write plays as well, and so the thing that I've noticed the difference there between fiction and playwriting is that for me, plays are, for me personally, and obviously people have written many different kinds of plays, but for me, plays are about compressed periods of time. So I'm, oh, I'm usually interested in only looking like at maybe a day or or a week or something like that. But if, if I'm interested in looking at a longer period of time, then I think more in terms of novels and things like that. But with, res with, the, you know, with respect to the idea of form, it's always the idea that we do, we have to figure out like what is the form of this thing gonna be. And in fiction, for me, sometimes that can be really hard. So for example, in the field hockey book, I knew that it was going to be first person plural. I knew that every chapter was gonna be a different game. I knew that every chapter was gonna be a different character. So sometimes in fiction, for me, it's actually harder to find a form than it is necessarily in poetry. But once I do, then, uh, that's like the hardest part of it, so, but thanks. Thank you. Um, then a question from Devanchi. Uh, what about the act of writing wounds you, and what about writing still confounds you or remains unknown to you? <laughs> I'm like, I, it makes me like, like pen, pen or pencil, boxers or briefs, you know what I mean? I'm like, Night, are you a night person or a morning person? Um, okay, so what about, what about writing confounds me, right? What about writing confounds me? Ooh, ooh, tough. Um, in some ways, just the, you know, the idea that, that we do this and that it's the idea, you know, especially if you think, I, I often think in terms of like runners, right? So a marathon runner versus a sprinter. Um, 
not, not necessarily everybody can run a marathon, although you can train for it, but we can all sprint, or I, I suppose that sounds kind of ableist, but what I mean by it is in thinking about poetry, um, it's the idea that poetry is all around us, although we sometimes don't know that. And so, I, okay, so I've now thought of something. Um, and so it's the idea that, again, I'm always telling my students, my students, they know a lot about fiction, and you know a lot about fiction because we all, we watch TV, we read movies, we've read short stories, we know, we know how to tell jokes, we know what an arc looks like, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. But, we, but oftentimes my students feel like they don't know anything at all about poetry. They're like, oh, poetry is scary. And so I always want them to know that like, we're surrounded by poetry, Sometimes it's in song, sometimes it's in advertising, you know, like just do it. I mean, that is like a compressed poem that says so much in so many ways. So I think I'm not so much confounded by it, but it's the idea that I, I wish we kind of celebrated that fact more, that, that, that poetry and, and words as art are all around us and that you don't have to have a special degree or those kinds of things in order to celebrate that. Um, so yeah. I feel like I'm on a game show and I have a certain amount of time and, I, and I'm blowing everyone. I'm like, oh, yeah. So next time we double jeopardy. There's like, no car behind the, behind the door. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with everything Amy says. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I think, you know, um, if language is a species, then the sentence is an expression of its DNA. And I think the beauty of the sentence and syntax is that there is a personhood expressed through it. And I think that's what really moves me. When you're reading a poem, you're not just reading you know, a piece of language organized on a printed piece of paper. You're reading someone's um, idiosyncratic energy. You're reading a personhood shared through this incredible technology, and I, I insist that language is a technology. It's perhaps our most advanced because you can have technological advances in weaponry and pharmaceuticals and technology, but only through language can you convince people to die for it. Mm -hmm. And that has been happening through the beginning of the enterprise of language. And I think what confounds me about writing is, is the, the longer I do it, the, the less I know why or how it works. Um, and, and I don't mean to be glib, I just, I realized that, I think I was reading Robert Bresson's um, theory on cinematography, and he says something that I found so true, when he says the color red is very different when it's next to blue. And so you realize that transformation happens in proximity. And likewise, you can, it's hard, it gets harder and harder to say what's, what's good, to yourself, but you can say whether it works or not, but, but there's no rules. You know, it's all in relation to how that piece of language exists in relation to the other um, sentences or images around it, and then how that is in relation to the world, um, which is perhaps not so confounding after all. It becomes actually very liberating to, to know that um, you, know, you can try your best and maybe a hundred years from now, language would have morphed so much that um, what you're doing actually really is writ in water, um, and it starts to fade from its original meanings. And there's a, there's a beauty and a freedom in that, um, in, in that great mystery. You know, when I was a younger writer, I was so um, befuddled about the difficulty of reading and writing and getting it right, getting the dream in the head Right, and as the more I write, the real I realize that the the journey is just getting close to the dream. That that all my work is just coming very close to the dream, and still seeing the dream intact, and seeing language's aspirational attempt to come close to what you had in your head. And that distance gets, if we're lucky, it gets shorter and shorter. But I think that distance is actually where all of the dynamism happens. When we, when we share the piece of writing with the world, that little line, that little you know, one inch line is actually where all of us really see each other. Um, so I think being confounded is a, is a very freeing thing at the end. Thank you. Um, these are two anonymous questions. Uh, what music do you like to listen to when you write and or favorite Frank Ocean song? and or. Amy, do you have a favorite Frank Ocean song? <laughs> um, 
Um, I love all of Frank's work. Um, I think <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. I think um, um, he has that incredible song about unrequited love, um, about being in a taxi cab. That bad religion, there you go. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't remember titles, but I know what goes on in things. Um, um, I love that one. And um, what I listen to, uh, mostly orchestral music, uh, you know, sad orchestral music. Uh, Niels, <laughs> Niels Fromm uh, is, a, is a favorite one, a modern composer, uh, Chopin. Uh, I think I like things that just kind of, it's hard to listen to with things with lyrics because you're trying to write. You know, um, so just atmospheric uh, music is very good. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, so I'm really like old school. <laughs> so I listen to, I don't, I, I don't listen to anything when I'm writing, but I do listen to a lot of jock rock. Jock rock, anybody like, like from the 1970s? I don't know. So I'm really like into like, I go down certain rabbit holes and the last big rabbit hole I went down was Phil Collins. Um, <laughs> And I don't know if it was those two kids who like um, who listened to shows for the music for the first time and got really into that drone part. Maybe that was the reason I went down that rabbit hole. But if you haven't heard Mama, yeah, that's that's the one. That's the homer for tonight. And write a sonnet to it. Um, so this is a question about um, or in relation to Kathy Park Hong's uh, minor feelings, um, where she discusses emotions that are negative, dysphoric, and. Uh, the result of constantly having one ident one's identity questioned, feelings like shame, irritation, anger. How do you, how do you see your poetry and work in relation to minor feelings? How do you understand minor feelings functioning in your work? And this is from Olympia. Uh, <laughs> I do, what is that really famous quote? Is it, is it Benjamin Franklin about like, you know, a fool opens their mouth and then like lets, and then, you know, people realize that they're a fool. I feel like that. I'm like, I should have just left after the reading. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, okay. <sighs> <laughs> Could have walked off into the sunset. Um, I actually, in my poetry, I'm thinking more about poetry than fiction, but I actually, maybe I'm wrong about this. I'm wrong about a lot of stuff about my own writing. Um, I don't think I write that much about myself. You could, you could hear CNN, you could hear the NPR sort of things in it. I'm interested in looking at, at those ideas, you know, um, but I think for me it's easier because I'm not necessarily writing personal story, right? And, but that doesn't mean that I don't try and implicate myself in that as well. So if I'm looking like at somebody else, I'm really interested in shame. And so I actually recently wrote a really long poem about shame. You know, I heard this terrible story about something that this father had done to his son that was just terrible. And, but I wanted to realize, like I wanted to think more about what shame is and like my own shame and shame and how this worked in this particular family dynamic. Um, so I think that because I'm always sliding into something through a lens that isn't a personal lens, it becomes easier for me to do those kinds of things. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a beautiful question um, and a beautiful answer. And I, I think the the, the more I, I work as a writer, you, and you realize that you you sit down, at least I sit down. You don't sit down writing as an Asian American or a queer person or what have you, because if you do that, you start to forego a lot of other parts of yourself. And again, you turn your work into a checkbox. And in many ways, the work will be checkboxed anyway. Um, and so I sit down knowing that everything I write through will be through the lens of this body, um, whether it's identities that are known, and it's also through identities that are unknown, unknown to others and even unknown to myself. Um, so even if I were to write an article like uh, or the, that the-ness to me is filtered through um, this, this personhood. And, and it, it involves everything, uh, Asian Americanness and what have you. And I think because of that, the more I work, the more I realize that I, I get more skeptical of, of what we mean when we say a marginalized writer. And I start to, to realize that I feel 
I've never felt like a marginalized writer. Because the question then goes, marginal to whom? Because the, the subject that I write about, the people I write about, ha have always been in the center for me. And I think I real, you realize that, uh, that all these uh, feelings and themes were always in the center. And I'm writing uh, stories that are very normal, even, um, that, 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 are, that takes up um, the center of my imagination. Vietnamese American life, queer life, working class, New England, um, queer ruralness, which is very important to me, have always been um, the, the foundation. It has never been on the margins. Um, and so I think it's important for me to articulate that because while I know that so much of, of the systems relegate us on the margins, it's a given, right? You're already there. So when I arrive at the page, it's the one opportunity to put something in the center. We are, we are most powerful, perhaps, under this, this guise of an authorship. And so when I write, um, I don't write as a marginalized person. The people I write about are never marginal. They are all I know. And um, it's important for me to, to, to say that. It took a long time to say it and believe it. And I don't, I don't mean everyone should believe that. You, everyone has their own journey. Um, but I'm, I'm finally at the point where I say that these subjects are, are the center. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, and this other anonymous uh, person in the audience um, asked if you could both write a future for us, or what does the future look like for us? <laughs> I, I, I feel like it's a very serious question as uh, poets who are constantly looking towards ourselves and our communities and what we, how we can see each other and project each other into the future. I'll give it a shot. Um, when I was a, uh, starting out in, in about 2006 and seven, I, I never imagined a room like this filled with so many folks from different places, with so many ideas. I never imagined um, that two Vietnamese American writers could, could um, write anything they wanted and to, to engage with the world in such a rich, in dynamic and indelible way. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to sound corny, but I think the future is, is realized here in ways I never imagined it. And those uh, who have been writing in the early aughts know that the writing world looked very different. It looked very different. You crack open Poetry Magazine in 2004, it was a very different world. You, you wouldn't, it was hard to imagine that it was just about 20, over 20 years ago. Um, but I, I, as a teacher, um, I, I think you know it's we're, we're in such an incredible moment for writing. So many of us are here. The internet has allowed the table, you know, the seat at the table, to really flatten and and to kind of you know almost be uh, demolished as a metaphor. And it, it's back to this open field, and it's. We have so many mediums for it, and I, I don't know where the future is, but I think it's, it's really strong um, for writing, and I feel really optimistic uh, about it. And, you know, we're alive for a very short time. You know, we're like sedimentary rock, and right now we're lucky to be on, at the, on top where the grass is growing. And, you know, nurturing that soil and, and and articulating your your turn, um, you know, at, at at the expression of that organic life, um, is a is a deep blessing. And then soon, it will be calcified into stone, and another generation will have their chance. Um, and, and you know, so far, the 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 history of literature has survived everything. The the endeavor of storytelling in any medium has survived. 
uh, actual, you know, apocalyptic scenarios. And um, I, it's not so much uh, empty faith at this point, but uh, a sort of a calculated, learned, and historic truth um, that, if anything, we'll, we'll just keep telling stories. And the more of us at, in the field, the better. Um, it's hard to stay in the field. Um, but it's important to remind us that you know, it is, it is a field and it's wide, wide open. You, you don't have to get a degree to be a poet. You could be a poet tonight. And that's, that's true. That's not hyperbole or, or, or a glib statement. Um, so because of that, I'm always optimistic when it comes to the future of, of writing and storytelling. Amy. Juan Bari and Ocean Wong, thank you so much. <laughs>